Spin Doctors were known for their two huge hit songs in the early 90s, including Two Princes and Little Miss Can't Be Wrong. Both singles were top 20 hits on the Billboard Hot 100 charts, but whatever happened to the group? That's what we're going to discuss in today's video. Born in Hawaii, frontman Chris Barron would spend the early part of his life in Australia. His parents would soon divorce with his father remarrying, and he would move Chris back to America with him to Princeton, New Jersey. It was there that Barron attended high school, and by his own admission was, and I quote, a weird freaked out artist kid. His early musical influences would include Buddy Holly and Bob Marley, and attending the same high school would be future blues traveler frontman John Popper. Popper played the part of older brother to Barron and even wrestled against him. After graduating from high school, Barron would spend the year studying poetry at Bennington College, a liberal arts school in Vermont. He would eventually find his way to New York City and study music at New School of Jazz and Contemporary Music, while also bunking with Popper and playing solo shows around the city. Barron's future bandmates and spin doctors would hail from Canada and other parts of the States. Guitarist Eric Shankman would grow up in Toronto, Canada, coming from a pretty musical family. He was already an accomplished guitar player by the time he turned 10, and 11 years later at the age of 21, he would move to New York and study at the same school. Also attending new school was drummer Aaron Kames, who originally hailed from Dallas. While the trio wouldn't form a band just yet, Baron and Shankman would team up with Popper, playing in the group Trucking Company. But the group was short-lived as Popper soon left to devote more time to his own band Blues Traveler. This would lead to the remaining pair of Trucking Company teaming up with Kames, and this would result in the birth of the Spin Doctors. Baron would reveal in the book Jamerica what the common thread was between the three musicians saying, we were always really interested in improvisational music. The group would play their first show at a frat house in Columbia University. It was following that gig that the band decided to go all in, with Baron recalling to Rolling Stone. After that gig, Eric got back to his house at 9.30 in the morning. We carried his amp to the top of the stairs, and he lived on the fifth floor. When we got to the top, we just laid down on the landing. Eric's like, look man, this is the way it is. Do you want to do this? And I just started laughing. It was 9.30 in the morning. The sun was coming through the window and it was definitely going to be work, but it was real. So I was like, yeah, man, let's do it. Bassist Mark White wouldn't join the group until a few months after the band's first gig. By the time he auditioned, he was working in a mailroom and was several years older than the other members. He'd already played with Aaron Kames and several other New York bands, including one called Spade. He would admit to the Morning Call newspaper that he initially turned down an opportunity to audition for Living Color. With their lineup in tow, Spin Doctors would cut their teeth playing live gigs in New York and the surrounding areas. All of it wouldn't have been possible without Barron's dad, who helped co-sign a loan for a vehicle which shuttled the band's equipment to clubs and college campuses. Barron would tell Diffuser, we just kept going back. We were also a really good live act. We would go into a new town and play for the bartenders and servers and three or four people. Then we'd go back and play for 15, the next time we'd play for 45. By the third or fourth time we'd pack it, he'd say. Also helping build the band's live audiences was word of mouth and bootleg tapes, which they encouraged amongst their fans. Spin Doctor seemed to be initially labeled a jam band, frequently compared to groups like Fish and The Grateful Dead, with no two live shows being alike and with fans bootlegging their concerts. But at the same time, jam bands weren't exactly tearing up MTV, so it was a difficult balancing act. The Orlando Sentinel described Spin Doctor's crowds in 1993 as being, and I quote, tie-dyed, hippified audiences who also frequented Fish and Blues Traveler concerts. But bassist Mark White brushed off some of these comparisons, claiming he had never heard of the Grateful Dead until he joined the band and cited his influences as Isaac Hayes and the Jackson 5. The band gigged relentlessly, playing upwards of 250 dates a year, including playing the New York club Nightingales a whopping 57 times. With White recalling to the Orlando Sentinel, we had all the people coming down night after night. There was an endless supply of people coming down. They would bring their friends, and they would bring their friends. We always had a crowd, he'd say. Epic Records head Richard Griffiths would sign Spin Doctors after seeing the band play a show at the Wetlands, a small New York City club. The capacity of the venue was around 300 people, but the night he witnessed the band play, there were 600 people in attendance. He would tell the Chicago Tribune how he found something different about the band, saying, It wasn't a rock audience. It wasn't punk. It was a different type of audience. It looked like college kids. The next day, I told their manager I wanted to sign them. Epic Records' plan was to release an EP in early 1991, and the original idea for the EP was to be a studio effort consisting of the tracks Two Princes and the combo of Shinbone Alley and Hard to Exist. That would set up their future LP, Pocketful of Kryptonite, that was scheduled later that summer. 
Their plans would change though, as Kames would reveal to Diffuser saying, we thought we're this live band and we have a great reputation as a great live band, so let's put out a live EP and hold off on more studio recording. To capture their live EP, the band recorded a September 1990 show at the Wetlands Club in Manhattan. It was a venue that the band performed at quite frequently, and it was special because they allowed bands to perform the entire night. Spin Doctors would end up renting a mobile recording truck to capture that gig. The band soon turned their attention to their first full-length studio record, Pocket Full of Kryptonite, enlisting the same producers who worked on their EP. Baron would look back at the group's first LP telling Diffuser, We didn't want to go in and make some overproduced record. We wanted it to represent who we were, and you can feel that. The basic tracks are a live band on the floor. We did some overdubs, but we didn't get carried away with it all. So when you hear the record, it just sounds like a four-piece band. We were this really weird jam band who happened to have great songs, and a couple of our songs were so great they ended up being hits. Two Princes wasn't a hit when we wrote it. It was just a really good song that made your girlfriend want to bone you, he'd say. According to Comes, who wrote the liner notes in the band's 2011 anniversary edition of their first LP, he would write, at the time, they made a demo of it referring to Two Princes. We consciously made a decision to slow the tempo down and let the groove fatten up on the album version. I honestly think if we hadn't made those changes, it wouldn't have been the hit that it was. Also appearing on the album was longtime friend John Popper, who played harmonica on the track More Than She Knows and earned a co-writing credit on the track Hard To Exist. Released in August of 1991, the initial sales of Pocket Full of Kryptonite were relatively small, moving around 60,000 copies by the end of the year. Those sales came on the back of the band's live gigs, and by the end of 1991, the label wanted to leave the record behind and move forward. They pushed Spin Doctors to get off the road and hit the studio once again, but the band pushed back. Baron would tell Diffuser, Sony, who owned Epic, was way more into Pearl Jam and Michael Jackson when we signed. We were the redheaded stepchild of the label, even though we were signed personally by the head of Epic Associated. We toured really hard. They wanted us to come home and make a record, and we decided to stay out on the road, he'd say. For the first part of their career, the Spin Doctors were living in the shadow of Blues Traveler. The group frequently opened for Blues Traveler and stole some of the group's fan base, but at one point Spin Doctor's label even sought advice from Blues Traveler's label on how to break the band. It was a difficult existence for Spin Doctors with Baron recalling those early years to Rolling Stone saying, A lot of the time we hid from Epic how hard the stuff was. We'd be like, we're out in the van, it's no problem at all. We put up a front because we wanted to be their badass band. But the van was death, man. A slow form of death, he'd say. Another fellow at Epic Records named Frank LaRocca, who was also instrumental in signing the band to the label, had a number of people at the company calling for the band to get a makeover, telling Rolling Stone, there's been some complaints. They don't have any tattoos. They don't have any weird colored hair. People said try to get them to dress up for Saturday Night Live. Despite the lack of album sales to their name, the band members saw their audiences growing and felt a buzz around the band by the new year. As the buzz was growing by 1992, the band tried to push their label to finally release some singles from the album, with Comes recalling the Diffuser. Why don't you try Two Princes or Little Miss Can't Be Wrong? And their response was, nah, those aren't hits. You guys don't have enough tattoos or it's not grungy enough or whatever that crap was. The album would nearly take a year to break, with Comess adding a station in Vermont called WEQX. This guy named Jim McGinn, great guy, started playing Little Miss, and it went to number one on the station, and he hand wrote a letter to the president of Epic saying, you guys should really go after this band. You'd be crazy if you didn't. This is an incredible reaction we're getting here. That's what lit the fire, and then Epic put it on rock radio. They made a video. They got behind it and then everything blew up, and of course we were like, we knew it all along. Of course, the record label claimed that was their plan all along. Griffiths, who signed the band, would tell the Chicago Tribune, rather than bang radio over the head, I made a decision to pull back. So we made a video that we never submitted to MTV and kept them out on the road. Then a couple of radio stations in Vermont picked up on the record and started playing it to an incredible response. In all honesty, I thought it would take a lot longer than it did for them to make it. I was only planning on selling 50,000 copies of the album, and I would have been happy, but the public spoke, he'd say. There were only a few believers in the company. The Spin Doctors couldn't have been less trendy if they tried. They had nothing to do with Seattle, and we were concentrating very much on Pearl Jam, so I made a conscious decision not to oversell them to everybody in the company, he'd say. By the fall of 1992, the band soon landed a spot on Saturday Night Live. They appeared on The Howard Stern Show and were featured in Rolling Stone magazine, and things only further blew up from there. Radio and MTV started playing Two Princes and Little Miss Can't Be Wrong, both of which became top 20 hits on the pop charts, and at the end of the day, their debut album sold 6 million copies. Their label would also add new tracks to the group's first EP and re-released it as well. 
The track Little Miss Can't Be Wrong would be written by Barron in response to his stepmother, who he referred to as, and I quote, a malignant narcissist who never believed in Barron's career aspirations. But he did have some regrets with the band's newfound fame at the time, recalling to Rolling Stone. When I wrote Little Miss Can't Be Wrong, I never dreamed it would be on hundreds of radio stations several times a day. So then you get to thinking, okay, what is a song like Miss doing to people? One of the things I really admire about Bob Dylan is that he wrote great pop songs that were constructive. I don't want to sing a song that degrades people who were traditionally degraded, he'd say. Despite the band's newfound success, some markets were less than eager to embrace them. Sometimes they'd play theaters packed with thousands of people, while other times, not many people would show up. Barron would admit to the morning call, the stupidest place we played was Harpo's in Detroit, Michigan. This heavy metal place where they had these mega death videos and hundreds of people screaming. They had a t-shirt and a wet willy contest before we played with all these naked dudes on stage and by the time we came on everyone had cleared out. In the summer of 1992 the Spin Doctors would reconnect with John Popper as Blues Traveler had put together a musical festival that would be inspired by Lollapalooza which debuted the previous year. The tour would be known as the Horde Festival which stood for horizons of rock developing everywhere and it would include other groups including Fish, Widespread Panic, The Samples, and Aquarium Rescue Unit. And Horde would prove to be a success and would carry on for the next seven years and it would give the Spin Doctors a massive publicity boost. The single Two Princes would be nominated for a Grammy and become the number one rock single of 1993, outpacing other tracks by mega artists including Aerosmith's Livin' on the Edge, Duran Duran's Come Undone, and Nirvana's Heart Shaped Box. Frontman Chris Barron would become known for his clever lyrics, telling Access Online in a 2018 interview, I work really hard on the lyrics, I slave over them, I practice the way a runner would run. It doesn't have to be clever necessarily, it just has to be right. I always point at the song Louie Louie, nobody knows what the F the guy is singing, but it doesn't matter whatever he's singing, we know it's the right thing for him to be saying on that song. In addition to MTV and rock radio heavily playing the band's music, Hollywood came knocking as well. Their cover of the song That's the Way I Like It was licensed for the movie Space Jam in 1995, and Two Princes was widely licensed, even being featured on an episode of South Park in season 21 and the TV show Sesame Street. Both Two Princes and Little Miss Can't Be Wrong would also show up on the video game Rock Band. The band even contributed theme songs to seasons 2 and 3 of the TV show Spin City, but things seemed to slow down for them by 1994 when they put out their sophomore record aptly titled Turn It Upside Down. The album was a modest success selling a million copies, and the single You Let Your Heart Go Too Fast was the most successful track off the album, but it wouldn't even be a top 40 hit, while the album peaked at number 28 on the charts. The band would appear at Woodstock 94 and Glastonbury Festival the same year, but the stress of pushing hard over the last couple of years will cause friction in the group. On the eve of a series of South American stadium dates opening for the Rolling Stones, the band's guitarist Shankman quit. Barron would tell the LA Times, It was frightening at the time. It was a really big wake-up call. It led to a lot of soul-searching and made me grow up a bit. Not to take things for granted. It was an incredible lesson. Shankman, meanwhile, would tell the Sag Harbor Express, I felt like it had stopped being what I thought it was, so I just got off the train. But there were warning signs as Barron would tell the LA Times that the group's second album was, and I quote, a painful album for me. It had a lot of painful personal references to me. It's hard for me to be objective about it as a work of art. Under pressure from their label to write another hit album, the band initially threw out a whole set of tapes and came up with another full set of songs, but it proved futile with Barron telling the same publication. We weren't communicating, there wasn't a dialogue going on. Thankfully for the band, they still made their tour commitments, but with a replacement guitarist. The group would soldier on working on their third album, You've Gotta Believe in Something, which came out in 1996. For the new record, Barron shaved his beard and cut his hair, as it hadn't been cut since the publicity photos were taken for the first album. It was partially done in response to critics who prejudged the band, with Barron telling the LA Times, I guess I was wondering if people would still call me a hippie if I cut my hair off, you know. I never knew where the hippie thing people kept saying came from, and I felt it was from fashion. Also, I really do have a lot of soul searching to find myself in the process of doing a record. It starts with checking out my face, he'd say. The group's third album was do or die for the band. Retailers would take a wait and see approach with the group according to Billboard, but the record label touted the album, claiming to Billboard that the group still had an active following on the internet. And while the first album spoke to the mainstream, the second record spoke to their core audience. In the run-up to their third record, the band appeared on the Howard Stern radio show in 1995 ahead of Stern's book Miss America coming out and performed a song with the same title even though it wasn't on the record. The label even procured videos from film students for the single She Used To Be Mine, but at the end of the day, album sales of their third record were even less than their predecessor and the band soon lost the recording contract with Epic Records. 
This was a challenging time for the band with plenty of highs and lows. In a 2002 interview with MIT's newspaper, The Tech Online, Barron talked about where the band was at at this point, saying, It's more of a matter of getting back into where we came from rather than developing. We started out as this bar band, this nightclub type of band with this meteoric rise. I think right now we're sort of getting back to rocking audiences as hard as possible. But he would admit in the same interview that he still loves singing the band's biggest hit, Two Princes. Ahead of releasing their fourth album, Here Comes the Bride, in 1999, the band inked a new deal with Universal. But several weeks ahead of the album coming out, Barron lost his voice due to a rare form of vocal cord paralysis. The medical condition was so severe that he was given a 50-50 chance of being able to speak again, let alone sing. Keyboardist Ivan Neville would take over singing duties for a few months, but their 1990 tour would end up being scrapped anyways. Barron's voice would return the following year, and he spent his time recovering, writing new songs with his old friends from Blues Traveler. The Spin Doctors would take some time off, but the news that the Wetlands was closing to make room for a condo development brought them back together. The Wetlands was a special place for the group, as it was where they recorded their first EP, and they would go on to play a successful show on September 7, 2001, during the last week the club was open. The band would get a bit of a boost when their fifth album, Nice Talking To Me, got radio play with the track Can't Kick The Habit. From 2008 onwards, the band resurfaced to play one-off live shows, and the members have explored other projects. In 2011, the band geared up for a US and UK tour to celebrate the 20th anniversary of their debut album, and in 2013, they released their latest and sixth studio album, If the River Was Whiskey. A few years ago, Rolling Stone magazine would publish a reader's poll of the worst 90s bands, and Spin Doctor, surprisingly, took the number eight spot, but Nirvana was also on the list. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe, and we'll see you again in Rock and Roll Stories. Take care.